We're honored today to have Cardinal Turkson, who's the president of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, to talk to us today about reforming the global financial system, which I gather has been a source of some problems in recent years. Um, I wanted to ask the Cardinal first, um, what's been keeping him up, up at night recently? What issues have you been struggling with, have you been uh, dealing with, and why? Thank you uh, for the question. <laughs> uh, basically, what our office has been dealing with lately is just been precisely you know, the uh, current financial economic crisis. And uh, although we recognize as a church that we don't dispose of the you know, technical solutions and all of that, but we still, we still have one thing, you know, we still follow humanity. We still, humanity is basically our area of you know, work. And, and so we uh, follow the present economic crisis and want to consider very many causes of this crisis, the impact that it has on people, especially the poor. And then, and, you know, suggest or engage, you know, uh, the G20, the IMF and all who matter on the, on the joint reflection for a solution, you know, to, 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 to this problem. Because we think that this present economic crisis is not an experience which, you know, causes us to despair of solutions and, you know, throw up our arms and, you know, uh, despair, but it's a challenge rather to discernment, to find out what we've done and done wrongly and, and to you know, uh, identify what the strong areas that we need to you know, uh, emphasize on and, and, and uh, develop uh, solutions from there. So uh, we, want to, we want to stress the, uh, the part of you know, uh, this crisis being an opportunity for an ongoing discernment about, about, about you know, the financial you know, world, the economic structures, how the financial market has been operating, how the market has been operating until now. So that's what we want to do. And in doing that, uh, we are encouraged by the fact that, for us, this is an opportunity to also recognize that uh, as a church. Our big thing is, you know, just to call people to optimism. Optimism not because it is baseless, but optimism because it is rooted in the present and the future. And basically, uh, the source of our optimism is basically for us because the future is ultimately God. And we can always seek that. So this is uh, what, uh, what, what that thing has been. And we encourage in this regard by two statements that past popes have made. Like, you know, Pope John XXIII, who came out, you know, in the period of the Cold War with an encyclical called Pacham in Terrace, invo you know, inv invited us to, you know, to be ready to not to be afraid of new ideas, even when they disturb the established status quo of things, not to be ready not to be afraid of, uh, you know, of uh, espousing new ideas. And subsequently, uh, Pope Paul VI also came out with a you know, message inviting us to, to be to, to courageous in our imagination of what is possible so that we can modify and change the present experience of the world for the better, for the better, for the realization of the common good of humanity and all of that. So this is what you know, our office currently is engaged with. And that kind of, you know, thinking or feeling fueled into our pro production of a small document, which we call a note, on the, uh, yeah, I think you're holding a copy <laughs> out, there, out, there, out, there, out there in your hands. Uh, we came up with that last October, just, just before the G20 met in Cannes, okay, in mm -hmm. France. And, and the objective was simply to contribute to the ongoing search for a solution to the economic, you know, economic crisis. And you have the sense that this economic crisis was a moral crisis, not just a technical crisis of too much liquidity. In the I system. think I, I think it's both. Of, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. both. It's, uh, there, there is a technical, there, there is a, you know a moral side to it, as you probably you know, people from Wall Street. If, if, there, if there's any merit to the movie, you know, okay, Wall Street, <laughs> and if there's any merit to similar you know products that have come, you know, with even you know popularizing the jargon, greed is good, and all of that. If there's, any, if there's any validity to all of those, and then it just means that it's all not been morally sound, okay, mm. in, this, in these financial transactions. And for us, it's about time that we realize that and begin to realize in that connection that the, the, the real objective of our financial enterprise and market and the doing of business is, is actually the well-being of the human person right. or the common good. So we think that you know, the human person should not in any way serve as a tool for market, 
Mm. Market should rather serve as a tool for the well-being, for the common realization of the common good. And so in this connection, we want to, we want to you know, uh, invite people to recognize, for example, the fact, you know, the, the, the fact that finance should serve decent economics. Decent economics being our way of managing, if you want, the world household in such a way that you know, its resources can take care of its needs. So we want to invite people to, you know, etymologically to go to economics, okay? Oikos and nomos, the laws of the household. And the laws of the household just basically invite us to see how we can manage the principle, whatever of the two, so that the, so that the household can be nourished by the resources available to it. And so uh, for us, this is part of the process of discernment which we should be doing, okay? Going back sometimes to the basics to discover what we need to do and do right. And so that we hold the focus then should be the human person, his well-being, his dignity, and his development, the human development. And ensure that everything we do, including the finance market and all of that, they serve to promote you know, good banking, good economics, so that the human person can you know, live and live well. So that would be the yeah, moral side. The, the technical side, has to do with, you know, fine, everybody knows about the development of the bubble and the development of direct, uh, you know, the, uh, the <laughs> derivatives and all the other problems that, you know, they, 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 they cause. So it is just, you know, uh, again, in that, in that regard, uh, to an advert of fact, technology is certainly good. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's part of even God's mandate to uh, humanity at creation to dominate the earth. So it's, it's, it's good, mm -hmm. but we dominate the earth for the well-being of the human right. person. So technology is such that it should also serve the well-being of the human person, and the human person not serve technology. You know, uh, an interesting example can be, you know, so an auto industry technologically can come up with the most advanced system of, you know, mot automobile, with endowed with all the gadgets and everything. But that's not the end of the consideration. Okay, the end of the consideration, it's not the end of the consideration in the sense that what we're looking at is not how much, okay, the technical staff can equip that vehicle. We need to think about the driver. We need to think about pedestrians. We need to think about, you know, the roads on which. So there are very many other aspects to all of this. And so we want to draw attention to the fact that in all of these, let us not just look at technology and what it can do, finance, economy, and the markets. Let's think about culture. Let's think about ethics. Let's think about society, and let's think, you know, let's think about the well-being of the human person. It's just, that's the basis, you know, the character of our reflection. Did you generate any insights about globalization? Because you have, in the financial industry, one of the world's most globalized industries, uh, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, the church often directs its words to people who are rooted in particular places, at particular times, in particular cultures. Uh, we haven't really thought morally enough, I think, about globalization. Did you have any broad reflections on we that? We did. We did. I mean... When it's so having so identified and analyzed the situation, uh, we we then have to propose you know solutions still for reflection, and we thought that one in the first place we should rethink our you know our humanism a little bit. Mm -hmm. What's our sense of the human person, you know, and and you know so generate a new form of humanism, you know, synthetic humanism that kind of recognize the human person not simply as a material aggregate of it, the right. quantifiables and all of that, but also reckon with the quality, qualitative part of it. Part of it would include, you know, his own openness to transcendence. Okay, transcendence which can equip him to ask questions about why. The teleology, as it were, the object, the vision of human life and human existence, the nature of the world and, you know, uh, and its own external existence. Ecology itself as its own program way and above the use that we make of it. Okay, and, and if, like all Christians would do, we consider ourselves to be stewards of creation, yes. uh, the need for some sort of responsibility in, in how we make use of. So all of these considerations came in. And at the same time, you know, so if we thought that we should invite people to, you know, consider a new form of humanism, so did we also invite people to consider one thing which is with us. I mean, globalization is with us. Mm -hmm. And if globalization is with us, it's basically because it's inviting us to recognize the interconnection, interconnectedness, and interrelatedness 
of the world family. And your church is arguably the oldest global institution in the world. <laughs> and for that matter, sometimes we say we're experts of humanity. Yes. So, so, so uh, that, that's, that's part of it. I mean, if there's any fundamental ethic to globalization, it is, it is the fact of the, you know, that the trust towards making us recognize that the human, the human family is essentially one and it belongs right. together. And so if globalization with everything that is happening invites us to consider ourselves as, you know, globally belonging to one, you know, you know uh, public community, then the question that arises from that is if, 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 if the talk is about a global public, you know, political community or family, is it also time to talk about its administration? Right. Okay, and the possibility then that since, you know, globalized, it goes beyond the competence of every single, you know, nation. Mm -hmm. And so there are situations, in fact, what we call common good, peace, security, food, water, and all of this, all of these common goods at this point in time cannot be safeguarded by individual single nations. It's become, it's, it's called for the venture, the effort of all, all, no, all, all, all of us. So this is also driven us to pose the question, is it time to think about evolving a global political authority of some universal competence? Yes, I wanted to ask you, what do we do about this financial problem? Did you generate any new ideas, any new model, any new way of thinking about these problems and some positive suggestions to uh, reform the system for the future? Definitely, uh, de definitely. Okay, we have decent existing in our policies. The Brenton Wood institutions and all yeah. of those uh, do exist. Our, our small thing was simply to, you know, address to them again a the small caution. Yeah. Okay, that uh, the concern of all of this being the human person, the market and its interest should not be the driving force. It should not be the only thing in the driving seat. Okay, but the well-being, the common good of the human person should direct it a little bit. And that, you know, the free, you know, use of, you know, uh, accumulation piling up of credit, okay, uh, which finally bubbled and exploded and got us into all of this, that should also be controlled a, a, a little bit. And then also, you know, uh, thought about the possibility sometimes of uh, considering the social scope of, uh, of the financial market and its, you know, its business. In this sense, you know, I'm glad to know that some have already thought about you know, tax on financial transactions to support okay, other sectors of society. Some have also even talked about the Robin Hood tax in the case of Britain. Okay, in the United States, they talk about the Tobin tax. All of these are uh, forms which are suggested by way of you know, having the financial market respond better to the social, because who makes the fortunes of the financial institutions is a civic society. It would be good, therefore, to also see what they can also put back into civic society to sustain it. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's suggestions that we made. Yeah. So more regulation, more taxes. Definitely. Um, and how would you do that in the global context with capital being so free moving? Okay, uh, capital moves freely. And moves freely, that's part of the thing again of because of its fluidity now, mm. uh, it's beyond, again, the, the, the control, the regulation of a single individual state. That's what we're calling for this, you know, uh, global public authority of some universal competence. Mm. Okay, it, this will be, it will be a group that would evolve gradually. It's not something to be imposed. It's something that the different nations, you know, uh, would, would, uh, would, would come up with and adhere to freely and, uh, and uh, willingly. And the idea is that this would not, would not be just another type of United Nations. In fact, the United Nations, with its spread and reach, can readily reform to do that. What is missing, like in the United Nations, is that the United States doesn't function as a suprapartist body with any protesters, with any authority to supervise, to impose, to regulate, or do anything. That's a, so in that sense, the UN, as it is today, cannot you know, do what we, you know, uh, talking about. Because the system will require a certain amount of, you know, regulation and authority to supervise, to control, and all. With even sometimes the possibility and the authority to even sanction, okay? All of that will be part of this. The United Nations 
it's not you know set up to do that although it's got the widespread and reach you know extending in almost every nation so in that sense you know that's a direction they can reform too on the other hand other institutions like the g20 the, and so imf and all also you know require a certain amount of you know uh, grouping but you know they have the character of like a club okay people come together it doesn't it lacks the representation okay of the world community and if that also opened up to representation wide representation of the world community that could also be in our function in that in that in that, in that direction so both regards can both institutions or so institutional structures and very many like them can function in that regard and when we call for this on the in international level, we can on the regional level advise the same thing. Okay, like you know the European Bank, okay, the African Development Bank. All of this, you know, uh, regional level could be advised to you know adopt a similar type of restructuring to be able to you know just uh, ma you know maintain this order. And what would the relationship of this public authority be to the World Bank or to the IMF, to uh, established institutions? The big thing is that they would all be regulating all of this to ensure the common good right. of the human family. Mm -hmm. The human family being the objective, all of this is to ensure that this body that we're talking about is a body that should serve the common good. Mm -hmm. Not by imposing anything, because it will have to function by two principles. Mm -hmm. The principle of solidarity, mm -hmm. okay, showing concern for the weak and the, you know, uh, uh, taking care of them, and the principle of subsidiarity, mm -hmm. which makes room yes. for the national bodies, the local groups to function yes. and to pursue their own common good. So uh, on the two principles are what will be required to guide the operation of this body. So while it uh, accepts the mandate then to exercise protests to ensure the common good of you know, global humanity, it still would make room according to the principle of subsidiarity, recognizing the competence of local national governments to pursue their own common good also on their level. Okay, so these two principles will be very crucial in the relationship that will be fashioned between the two bodies. And would it have a dis redistributive role, a Robin Hood role of taking from the rich and giving to the poor, or would it be more... That's, that's a Robin Hood type of thing. That's a Robin Hood type of You know, that is already practiced in some Right. states on a very, 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 very local level. So some of these are already practiced on very local levels. In France, for example, there is a practice called, uh, you know, uh, per, uh, yeah, I think it's a uh, per, per equation, uh, per, uh, per right. equation uh, in, okay. in French. And that, that practice on a very local level is something that exists among the priests in France. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that some work in rich parishes and some work in poorer parishes, okay. they pool their mm -hmm. income together and split it so that whether you work in poor parish or work in you know, a rich parish, you know, you do, it doesn't make a difference for you. That per equation, which can easily be you know, rooted in scripture and be justified out there, it's one way of also, you know, taking care of such needs. So the Robin Hood, you know, tax is there. Uh, taking from the rich and taking from the poor, it's not by way of exercising any coercive, you know, power of force. In Italy, for example, there's a practice called the patrimoniale. And it's a, it's a, it's a system of uh, taxation, which also recognizes that people who are endowed beyond a certain level are allowed to be taxed by the state in support right. okay, of some other group, depends on their patrimony. S some of them even pay their taxes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what, so, is, <laughs> what, what is the relationship between your church and other Christian churches and other religious denom uh, denominations? In this regard? Yes, in this regard. Now, we're, glad, we, we, we're, very, we're very glad to know that when we came up with a note, for example, mm -hmm. the Archbishop of Canterbury, at that yes. time, as you probably recall, there was a big group besieging his cathedral in St. Yes, Paul yes. out there. <laughs> so he, he, call, he called us and you know, wanted to make use of the note. Yes. Okay, although uh, the vision of a global public authority with universal confidence didn't immediately appear to be feasible, but, but the other details and other sides of the financial technological analysis, all those you know, things that you know, he bought into and so 
made use of, of, of the note already then. So we, 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 we're glad in that regard. Since then, I've also had a chance to receive communication from several other groups. The latest being a group of engineers. They could that calls itself a group of Christian engineers. Mm -hmm. But uh, the note came from the southeastern part of the United States, so I have a reason to suspect that they're from the so-called Bible Belt okay, okay. of the United States. And, and it's, calling, it's calling for inclusion in this consideration, saying that they have about 2 million registered chartered members, mm. engineers all around the world. And they are the ones who are foremost in their design and impacting directly on nature. Mm. They design the roads, stadia, mm. the buildings and all of that. So what happens to the environment is a large extent the work of their you know, yes. thinking and all. Mm. And so somebody should think about bringing them together to also you know, see how they could also have their profession inspired by some of these you know, discussions that we're doing. So, I think it's gone to places, but it's not always been positive. I mean, uh, some places, you know, somebody called it rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Is this Goldman Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that, that was uh, a that's it. That's, that's <laughs> and, and what are the next practical steps with, um, with your document? Where, where will you go from here, having, having published this? Having published this, which is meant to, you know, uh, invite, you know, ongoing reflection on the situation, we, we, we've directed our turned our attention specifically to, you know, Catholic businessmen, okay, right. and, and they are now uh, working with them uh, to us, okay, uh, producing what initially at uh, a seminar we conducted with them, we call the 10, you know, Sullivan Principles. Sullivan Principles refers to 10 principles which were evolved by pastor in the United States in the case of apartheid. So we, right. we, we, we evolve in similar principles to direct the operation of a uh, Catholic businessmen, and uh, we're hoping that by uh, by May would be able to you know uh, you know present uh, those principles to public. So so uh, we we engage in you know in, in, in doing that as a follow up on on this. Uh, so it's just that's not just talk, but it's shaping public opinion. Now, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, ch especially challenging mm -hmm. uh, you know Catholic businessmen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to be you know to have their be inspired by some of these principles. And uh, we don't expect the financial system to be crisis free in the future, so I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, reason to be debating these issues. I think we've now actually come to the end of our session, but that was Thanks. a wonderfully stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thank you.